So, uh, guys, we are very happy how this conference was going without any major hiccups until at 11.30 a.m. Uh, the next speaker, David Hogg, actually called and let Jiren know that he's uh, very unwell and he'll not be able to come and he's very upset about that. But then at 12.40, Jiren actually emailed Claudia and at 12.45, Claudia said that she's in. And so she has had literally one hour to prepare this talk and uh, thank you so, so, so very much for making it here, Claudia. Uh, <laughs> Claudia is the chief scientist at Distillery and also an adjunct professor at NYU Stern School of Business. And she's gonna talk to us about some of the cool projects she works at in, at Distillery. So truth be told, I didn't take one hour to make this talk. I had to cut it back to about half of what it was supposed to be in the hour. Um, so that's the talk I uh, gave actually yesterday at Strata. And um, well, thanks for having me. Um, my day job is in digital advertising. And so all I'm going to uh, kind of ponder about and uh, all generalizations um, claims here are only applicable to digital advertising where we use machine learning to target people to show them banner ads, ads on apps and um, video ads. So with that being said, um, the provocative stand I took uh, is with my ability to utilize terabytes of data and machine learning, a lot of the metrics people are very, very fond of in advertising, but I think the argument actually holds across the board, are becoming utterly meaningless and do the opposite of what they used to do. And one of these victims is uh, the click-through rate on banner ads. And here's the argument. So the issue with most metrics is that they don't really measure what you want to know. I mean, really, do we really care whether people click on ads? The point isn't whether they click. The point is we want to change their perception. We want to make them buy something, whatever the ultimate goal is. So we have all these metrics that proxy in some way for something because what you really want to know either is entirely unobservable or it just takes too long to get there. So you want to measure something before people buy. So what is a metric supposed to do? It's very simple. If I have two choices, A and B, I try them, I measure what happens, and then I compare for which of these choices the metrics look better and then this is the one I pick, right? Then you go with A. You do believe that A is better. And you hope that for the thing you really care about, you really made the right choice, that it wasn't just better for the metric, but what you ultimately want, your goal, the purchase, that's what's really better. So meet the old hero of advertising, the click. And it is supposed to proxy for interest in the product. So the assumption is if somebody is clicking on an ad, that they are interested in this thing and want to learn more and maybe buy. The problem becomes, if I'm letting loose all the machine learning techniques we have in big data, this thing gets killed. It no longer ref measures anything meaningful with respect to customer intent, nor does it lead you to the right decision. And the problem is that I can now optimize towards it. It's one thing to have a metric that just measures. But once you put incentive in place that you only pay me if I make this metric look better, then I'm going to optimize the hell out of it and you end up with the exact opposite of what you wanted. So switching to my day job, um, again, if you tell me, here's money, run a campaign, we're going to measure you on the click-through rate and you only get a renewal if that thing is larger than that of the other competitors are hired to do the same job. Well, it's a straightforward problem, right? All I need to do is predict who will click on that thing and then I'm going to target specifically opportunities, people who I assume or where the model predicts that there's indeed a high probability of that person clicking on the ad. So that's my day job, predict what people will do. Typically I refuse to predict clicks but we predict post view conversions. The argument's the same ultimately. Now I can't, or actually I'm being scientific for a moment, I don't want to use data from us for click prediction, but instead I'm going to use a publicly available data set from Facebook to demonstrate the effect here. So you can redo this. And um, I'm going to use um, gender as the prediction task um, for the argument. Here, this is what the data looks like. So there is an extract of about 200,000 uh, Facebook users. They're all anonymized. Um, and in there is a column that is gender. 
The base weight is about 60% for women. You have a few more demographic information there, like uh, birth year um, and uh, location. And then you get, in addition, a list of their likes. Again, all anonymized. So you can join these things and then you can model of it. What we're going to use, um, basically logistic regression, very sparse representation, binary indicators for those likes when we're trying to predict gender. So that's kind of where the big data or well, somewhat big data comes into play. Okay, how easy do you think is it to predict gender just based on age? Turns out you don't get very far, but actually it's not as hopeless as you may think because there's a lot of bias in the Facebook um, environment. So the accuracy isn't very good. And you get an AUC of po uh, 58. It's not great, but it's actually not entirely random. But what I care more about is what does the distribution of the prediction for female look like? It's a very noisy problem and you see that the density of the probabilities are pretty narrowly around 0.5. The model pretty much tells me that it has no clue what's going on. It predicts very narrowly around 0.5 for all people. Now, in targeting, I don't really care whether I get them right on average. That's not my problem. My problem, if I was to have to target females, well, I'm going to pick those instances where the probability of what I'm interested in is the highest. So I don't care what the average performance is. I want to know what is the accuracy out there. It turns out you do a lot better. You actually get 75% of women if you just look at the top 1% highest predictions. So despite it being noisy, you have more signal in the which is what you would hope. I mean, that's the whole point of having information in the prediction. If they predict higher, you do want to see a higher percentage. Now, let's give it more data. Let's add everything we have, all the likes in this binary format, do it again. What happens if you feed your model well? The accuracy overall goes up to 83%. The AUC is above 90 more interesting is the distribution of the probabilities. You see them kind of migrating to the extremes. Again, for people in machine learning, that's not really surprising. When you look just into the top slice, you actually get everything right. On the top 1%, I can perfectly target only women. If you look at the progression, you can actually play games here and say, what happens as I, as I add more and more data? So this is the age case where we were pretty clueless. Now I'm starting to add likes into it, and I'm adding them by frequency. So I'm adding um, content where most people like it first. And then I keep going, adding more and more of these features. So I'm expanding basically the feature vector. 10 likes, that's the distribution of the probabilities, and now you get already 86% correct in the top 1% predictions. At 100 likes, you get 100% correct in the top 1%. And then you just keep going and it gets further and further spread out. Why do I bother telling you all this and keep you from having coffee? Um, so the summary is the signal to noise in the predictive problem determines the distribution of the prediction, and in particular, the more signal you get, because of the data you have, the further it's pushed out. I'm not saying it's more data in terms of more examples, it's just a matter of kind of what's in your features that is relevant. The other interesting part is that in the top 1%, you can actually get pretty good accuracies or positives, right, even if overall you're not doing very well. That all sounds like good news, right? I mean, this is all meaning that my targeting should be useful. Well, here's the problem. Not all clicks are made equal. Here I'm showing you just the click-through rate on banner ads, and it's somewhere between, you know, one in a thousand, um, one in 10,000. I also show you the post-click conversion rate, meaning after somebody clicks, how many people then actually buy the thing or do whatever the con official conversion event is. Turns out it's one to two orders of magnitude fewer people that actually then do the thing you're really interested in. And all this, as far as I'm concerned, means two things. There's a lot of accidental clicks. Shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. For every time I clicked on an ad, 
I think 50 times it was by accident and maybe once it was on purpose. So the point here is there's a vast group of clicks that are entirely accidental and there's a very small percentage that probably truly means what we pretend click to mean. So in the old days, you know, fire me, no modeling, let's just at the old days. If you had option A, target women, option B, target men, turns out women are twice as interested in the product than men, both groups produce a whole bunch of accidental clicks. You still would correctly observe that the click-through rate is higher for women, and you would make the correct choice that that's the target group you should be focusing on. What happens now, however, I can predict the accidentals. In fact, I can predict them better than the intentional clicks. And the reason is there is contextual information that helps me predict the accidentals. People with eyesight problems, very bad motor control, other contextual information. So the accidentals kind of live on that far pushed out distribution. Whereas the intentional clicks are still hard to predict because it's really hard to predict what people are going to do. So if you now, in that case, pick the top 1% and target those people, you will see a great click-through rate, but none of these people is interested in the product. So by optimizing towards high click-through rate, you actually ignore anybody who would ever be interested in the product. And one of the indicators is, for instance, these are the um, top groups of apps with the highest click-through rate. No matter what the campaign is for, no matter what the product, we always see these apps showing up with the highest click-through rate. I want to highlight the uh, flashlight app. It's people fumbling in the dark. They really click at very high rates on your ad, no matter what the ad is about. So if you make me run a campaign for you with a high click-through rate being the requirement for renewal, all I need to do is run on the flashlight app. We actually also did it in display where we build models against clicks and then see how well does a model rank purchases. And it's indistinguishable from random. This is the AOC around 0.5. This is across 70 uh, campaigns. Meaning if you force me to optimize click-through rate, you may as well just you know, do it yourself and don't even bother targeting. Now, there are many more metrics of that sort that have the exact same problem. All of them are proxies. Many of them can be gamed and are gamed the moment that incentives are put behind them, especially when you have bots who can fake certain metrics. So video completion is the only group of targets that has the patience to sit through that boring ad are bots. You want 100% video completion? Not a problem. I can give it to you. Viewability is a similar one. So there is, however, a silver lining here. That principle, that different signal ratios kind of have different, different distribution goes both ways. On occasion, it helps me. Wouldn't it be great if you could predict who will go to a car dealership? You want to target people who are on the market for cars? Try to predict who will in the near future go to a car dealership. Now, this is not really easy to predict because how the hell do you get your target variable? How do you get the labels? So turns out with um, data combination, bringing in data for mobile devices, you can actually match locations and say, here is a, a car dealership, and then you can observe people who are there. So you can collect that data. The problem is it's super noisy because first you need to get all the locations right, and location data is uh, terribly unreliable with roughly 30% of the US population every day traveling faster than the speed of sound, according to the lat long information that we receive in the bitstream from those mobile devices. <laughs> we also see people piles in some uh, uh, field in uh, Kansas, <laughs> which is probably the geometric midpoint of the US, which is the place that a lot of these information defaults to. If no lat long information is available, they give me that. Or it's 
looked up based on an IP address. And again, you have people piling up in the middle of nowhere. The other problem is the association between a mobile device and your browsing history, which I need to model here, is noisy at best. Maybe, yes, you were at the dealership, but unfortunately, it's your wife's browsing history that I pull up. So all this to say, very often, the target variable is noisy for all of these reasons. I'm not really sure that the person was there. So I'm trying to recreate this effect on the data set from Facebook where I asking how much noise can I introduce in the target variable and still predict something. So I'm going to f basically randomly reassign the gender variable for a certain percentage of the data. Everybody clear? So here's what happens and you see on the x-axis the percent of original labels, meaning the other part I have randomly reassigned. And I'm measuring what percentage do I still get correct of women in the top 1% prediction? And it's surprising how robust the system remains to be. You can mess with half of the labels and you still get around 98% correct. You can mess with 75% of the labels and you're still close to 90% correct. Now the reason is I truly randomly mess with the label. So if the noise is random, again, it creates that middle section of the distribution, whereas the remaining signal occupies the extremes. And here is what the model looks like now. Red is the true positives, meaning women. Blue are men. And you see that despite messing with 50% of the labels, you have a very clean signal on the right reaching almost uh, only women that the model still finds from the signal in all of these likes. This is how the plot looks like for 25% um, and you still see on the t further right a very high percentage of correctly labeled examples despite the fact that I really um, changed a lot of the original information. So the summary, from a technical perspective, basically what happens here, you have two different generative processes. For the click, one is people intentionally looking at the product and a whole bunch of accidental ones. But you can't tell just looking at a click which one is which. What will happen if you target towards that, the model will pick the one with more signal. Now the real question is, is the one with more signal the one you're interested in or the wrong one? On the upside, the predictive model always almost acts a little bit as a low-pass filter that ignores entirely random information. So if you're lucky and your second process is completely random, you can get away almost with murder and still extract signal. From a practical perspective, what does it mean ab about metrics? I'm not saying you shouldn't look at these metrics like click-through rate anymore. The issue is I can only, or the, the practical upside is I can only make one look good. I cannot optimize multiple of these metrics at the same time. So I get either the click-through rate right or the post-view conversion. But if I really push the click-through rate to its extreme where I'm targeting only irrelevant people, the post-view conversions will look terrible. So some common sense to look across different metrics are probably uh, called for. And yes, if you can measure what really matters, by all means, please do. Thank you very much. Guys, once again. Uh, well, I'll be here for coffee if you want to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> once again, we are uh, short on time, so we'll try and restrict to one question, if it's a burning question. And she's going to be around for coffee, so. <laughs> I don't like to aggregate metrics, just look at them separately. I mean, the human brain can probably process three to maybe five dimensions. So I, I think yeah, the, this habit of always make a single. What I'm saying here is I can make one look really, really good. And that you shouldn't fall for. So if one sticks out like a, a sore thumb and the rest one's flat or down, that's an indication for the fact that I have optimized towards that to a level. So I just saying, 
keep your common sense. I'm not saying there is a silver bullet how all of these problems go away. I'm saying keep your common sense about it and be aware that with great data comes great power. I can do probably a lot more than you know. <laughs> all right, coffee break? Yep. <laughs>